presenter, Nick Crowder. Nick Crowder is the author of The Golden Handoff, How to Buy and Sell a Real Estate Agent's Business. Nick has been a top realtor since 2006 in the Portland, Oregon market. Nick is also an avid golfer, writer, reader, talker, and still gets up early, excited about what each day has to offer. We are very excited to have Nick present. So let's get started. I'm going to turn things over to our presenter. Nick, just want to say thank you so much for joining us. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you. I'm changing over to presenter, so privileges to you. Thank you, Nick. Excellent. Hello, realtors uh, in the entire U.S. and worldwide. I'm excited to have you guys here and excited especially to be uh, sharing this topic of investing for realtors in January as we start a new year and set new goals for our businesses and ourselves. Um, and this is a, a topic I am very uh, passionate about and excited to present because I think investing is one of the biggest things that can affect your wealth uh, and set you on a path to financial independence. So uh, with that, I'm going to talk to you guys today about investing in real estate, but specifically some of the pros and cons of being a realtor who is investing in real estate. What I often find with agents, uh, even top, top agents, is we do a great job advocating and working for our clients to help them buy, sell, and invest in real estate. And oftentimes we forget to take the time to build our own real estate portfolios for ourselves and our families, which can create uh, generational wealth. So as Brittany mentioned, I'm a real estate broker in Oregon and Washington, and I own city and state real estate. I'm very proud to say that this year I got my CCIM, which is a specialty in commercial real estate and investment real estate that I've been working on for quite a long time. And I also wrote a book called The Golden Handoff, which I would encourage everyone to read if you haven't already read it. It's about buying and selling a real estate agent's business. So it will help you build your business as you're growing your practice and then make sure it's set up correctly when you're ready to sell it and retire and hopefully retire earlier and with more money. So why invest in real estate? Well, real estate has some fantastic benefits that a lot of other investments just don't have. The number one thing when you're looking at investing in real estate is leverage. Let's say that you wanted to buy a $500,000 flex in your market. Well, you don't have to work and save and pay taxes until you have $500,000 saved. You can put a small percent down and borrow the rest of the money. Now, that might sound kind of pedestrian because we work in real estate and we work with loans all day long, but there aren't a lot of other investments where you could put down 5, 10, 20 percent and borrow the rest. It allows you to own more assets and build your portfolio quicker than if you had to pay cash for everything and you weren't able to leverage it. And another benefit of leverage, which I'll go into more detail later, is you can actually increase your rate of return if the property you're buying has a higher rate of return than the cost of the money you're borrowing. Another big thing with real estate is you get income from it. So if you're buying a cash flowing income property, not only do you own an asset that is hopefully appreciating, and history shows us that over time, real estate does appreciate. Um, but while you're owning an asset that's going up in value, you get to collect rent and income from that. And, it, and there's more than just rent, and we'll go into that too. There's a lot of different sources of income beyond just your base rents. Um, so that income is paying your expenses, it's paying your taxes, it's, and it's hopefully creating a positive return. I would argue that if you are an investor, your properties have cash flow right out of the gate. And if you don't have cash flow, I would say that that lends more on um, uh, speculation. The other thing is you can insure the property. So while you own an asset that your tenants are paying the bills on and, and creating extra cash flow, if there's anything that goes wrong with it, if it burns down or there's a flood, you have the property properly insured. Not only is it going to pay to replace the property and repair it, it will also give you payments for the lost rent 
So make sure you have a good talk with your insurance agent about the difference between a homeowner's policy and a landlord's policy. Now there's also really great tax benefits with real estate. You get to write off all your expenses, including your property taxes and interest. And you also get to depreciate the building. So in our example, if we have a $500,000 property, you might say that the building is worth 400 and the land is worth 100,000. Well, on that $400,000, you get to take a depreciation loss. And that's a paper loss. It's not actually money you're losing. It's just a, a financial accounting practice. And you get to write down um, your income with that uh, paper loss of depreciation. Now, the goal of all this, in my opinion, is to eventually get to a point of financial independence where your passive income from your investments exceeds the cost of maintaining your lifestyle so that your rent and your profit on your investments exceeds your cost of living. Now, let's look into leverage a little bit more. And I'm going to touch on the different types of properties you can invest in. So most people start out with residential. And a lot of folks start out with their first investment is their home or a plex that they buy that they use a unit for themselves and they rent out the other units. Now, the great thing about residential investment property that's owner occupied is you have very high leverage, as much as 100%. So USDA, VA, um, a lot of cities um, and states now have grant programs that along with FHA loans, create 100% financing. Uh, FHA is just 3.5%. Um, if you're buying an investment property, one that you're not intending to live in, uh, be prepared to need a, a roughly 20% down minimum. Uh, there are some programs for less, but you want to get in a position where your cash flow uh, covers your expenses. You're not feeding the investment that it's feeding you. Um, with commercial properties, that would be any apartments with five units or more, or office, retail, industrial, or land. Um, with owner-occupied, there are programs. So if you have an office building you use for your company, there are programs where you don't need as much money down. Um, typically, that's going to be your SBA loan programs, which require less down. It's kind of the commercial equivalent of an FHA loan. For true investment properties, typically, you're going to need um, about 20 to 25% down. So your leverage can be 75 to 80%. Um, right now, the apartment market in a lot of places is trading at pretty low cap rates, which means the return is lower uh, and it's closer to the interest rate. So some lenders might require 30, 35% down depending on the cash flow on the property. Um, and the other thing to consider with that is with commercial and apartments, the lenders typically look at how the building operates on its own as how they decide what to loan on and not loan on or how much to loan on it. So they're really looking at the cash flow on the property and the expenses. With residential, which is four units or less, um, they're typically looking at the strength of the borrower. So then your global cash flow, your um, credit score, those things matter a lot more in that instance. Now let's look a little bit about rent or, or your different sources of income. I mentioned earlier that obviously the, the main source of income on most properties is rent. But I, for example, the office building my company owns, uh, we have rent from multiple tenants. So we occupy part of the building. We have sub-tenants that rent other offices in the building. I have a parking lot that uh, is in an area where parking is very difficult to find. And so that parking lot is leased out after hours for uh, concerts and uh, sporting events. And we also have a billboard on the property. And I don't own the billboard structure, but the billboard company leases the land that the billboard sits on from me. And that is a very easy tenant to have. The check just shows up in the mail. I don't have to do anything. And they manage and maintain the billboard itself. Another great income source for a lot of landlords is cell towers. Those can be on their own poles, they can be on top of existing buildings. Um, with billboards and cell towers, the pro is they're very easy to deal with because there's really nothing you need to do as the landlord. But for someone to build a billboard or cell tower takes a lot of time and money. And so typically you're gonna see a 20 to 30 year lease commitment and that could prohibit 
future development. So be thoughtful of that if you have a property where the zoning allows for higher density development, because you might end up in a market uh, like where we've been, where a lot of properties, the land value has exceeded the building value. In rentals for residential, you, other ha you have other options as well to create more cash flow. So um, a lot of buildings will have coin-op laundry. Now they're all run off of apps and credit cards, but some buildings still have the old machines where you throw the quarters in to wash and dry your clothes. A lot of buildings now, a lot of landlords are charging pet rent. In our market, it's fairly common to see $25 per pet per month as pet rent and typically a higher deposit as well, since pets typically put a little more wear and tear on a unit. And then there's storage. So storage is a big issue, especially in more urban areas where people have less space and they don't typically have a garage where they need to store their stuff and they might be in a small micro studio or one bedroom apartment, but obviously they're not gonna fit everything they own in there. So having additional storage for rent can create more income as well. We talked about insurance. Now, the big difference between a homeowner's policy and a landlord's policy is uh, with a landlord's policy, not only does it cover liability and repair uh, and replace the property in the event of a loss, but it also will pay you for lost rent. One thing I don't have on the slide that I want to make sure I mention is that um, if you have a property and this is true pretty much for any property that is vacant for more than a month or two, you probably need to add an additional rider to your policy because there are certain losses that are not covered on vacant buildings. And so be aware of that. There's typically a time frame between a month and three months. Um, and so make sure you're, if you have a property that is either vacant because you're renovating it and the renovation is going to take a long time, or if you're between tenants and it's taking a while to find a new tenant, that you're aware of that so you don't inadvertently have a loss that isn't covered. Now, I wanted to talk about some of the deeper level tax benefits of real estate. The first one is you basically can defer your capital gains by using something called a 1031 exchange. A 1031 exchange is a, is the 1031 is the tax code it refers to, but what it means is that if you sell a property, an investment property, and you want to buy another investment property, and again, that has to be real property held for business or investment in the United States to do this, you can sell a property, have the funds go to a 1031 exchange provider, and then identify a replacement property within 45 days, and then you have to close within 180 days. And if you do that, <clears throat> you don't have to pay the capital gains. Um, it doesn't go away, but it is deferred and it rolls into the next property, which allows you to keep more of your cash, more of your equity rather invested in real estate as opposed to taking a big chunk of your equity in your gain and having to pay taxes on that and then basically losing that, the use of that money. The next thing that's pretty typical is your write-off. So you've got all of your expenses, um, your typical repairs, and you also have the depreciation. Another way to um, invest in real estate is through self-directed IRAs and 401ks. Now, typically people think of those as uh, retirement accounts, tax-deferred retirement accounts that are used to buy um, equities and bonds and things like that. But it doesn't have to be that way if you don't want it to be. And this is something to keep in mind as well for your clients if you have someone that has a lot of money in the stock market and they want to diversify, but most of their savings are in retirement accounts, there are ways to set up, again, self-directed IRAs and 401ks that can then invest in real estate. Now, there are specific rules and regulations that come along with that, so make sure that if you are um, using those vehicles that you're working with a good professional that can help you and your client uh, set that up and manage it correctly uh, so you don't validate those uh, those funds. Now, one other thing that realtors have access to if you meet certain qualifications is unlimited depreciation. Now, when I mentioned depreciation earlier, um, the depreciation you have on any given investment property, you can take against the income on the, that property and other passive investments. 
But what unlimited depreciation means is that you could typically, um, as opposed to just taking it against that income on that building, you can expand that to taking that loss against other active income. Now, there's a couple very specific steps with the IRS to qualify as a real estate professional. And so make sure you're very clear with your CPA on um, what those are before you decide to take passive losses against active income. But if you manage your own properties and you meet a certain hours per year requirement, um, make sure you understand if you qualify as a real estate professional according to the IRS. I know all of us as realtors see ourselves as real estate professionals, but there's a different definition for the IRS for depreciation purposes. Another thing to keep in mind about depreciation, um, there's two ways to take it. You can take straight line depreciation, which is you take an equal amount over the life of the property and the life of the property for residential, which according to the IRS, residential is all units where people live. So it could be your house, duplex, fourplex, it could be a 200 unit apartment for the IRS for depreciation. Those are seen as residential and you can take the value of the building and depreciate it over 27 and a half years. For commercial properties, that would be your office, retail, industrial, um, you can take the value and depreciate it over 39 years. Now keep in mind, you're not depreciating the land, so the value of your land is, uh, doesn't go down, but the value of your improvements in the building can be depreciated. So one other thing you can do is do something called accelerated depreciation. And I just realized there's a typo here. It says lot segregation study. That should actually read cost segregation study. Um, accelerated depreciation uh, allows you to do an engineering study or a cost segregation study on your building and reclassify a large amount of the real property as personal property. And what that allows you to do is as opposed to taking a straight line depreciation over 27 and a half or 39 years, you can accelerate that by taking a lot of those depreciation losses in the first five years and then the remainder over the rest of the life of the property. So again, make sure you understand what your tax liability is and how much income you have. And if you have a significant amount of cash flow and income, a cost segregation study, might be a way for you to limit or eliminate your tax liability in the first couple of years and keep more of your cash flow working. So the way I define financial independence is when your passive income is greater than your living expenses. A lot of business um, thinkers and, and philosophers will say that cash flow is king. And while it's great to have assets that are appreciating, you want to make sure you have cash flow not only to cover your expenses now, but to have a rainy day fund and extra reserve funds if you have a roof that fails or a furnace that goes out, or you have a building that uh, goes vacant for longer than you expect. So you're not coming out of pocket, but that the buildings are helping support themselves. Now here's some, some of the pros for investing that are specific to realtors. As realtors, you know, we're working every day, looking at the market, looking at property, helping our clients decide what to buy or what to sell, understanding what things, how the market values different properties. And so that gives us expert local kind of insider knowledge in our markets where we work about that. Uh, so if someone puts a property in the market and it seems like it's a crazy good deal, the first people to know that are the realtors that are looking at it. And we're there to help explain that to our clients. So that's something that we have an advantage in is that we're definitely in the know. We're also market experts. Um, the best realtors out there are making sure that they're staying on top of economic and political changes in their local uh, communities and economy. They understand if new employers are coming to town or if they're adding to a facility or if they're moving a facility out of town to know is our, you know, is your market growing? Are people moving in? Are people moving out? You know, what are rents doing? What are values of properties doing? The third thing is that I often hear that in an up market like we've been in for a long time, that it's very hard to find a great deal. But the truth is in any market, you can find a good deal if you understand seller motivation. Most people, and I think that the iBuyer um, 
businesses are, are building their entire model on this is that dollars and cents isn't the only thing that people care about, that there are a lot of other factors that matter to a seller than just the money. So for example, if someone wants to sell, but they, they need to stay in their home for a couple months, if you can accommodate that, they might take a lower price. If someone needs to close very quickly, you can accommodate that. If someone is worried their property won't finance or if it objectively won't finance and you're able to pay cash, you can get a better deal. So understanding the seller's motivation and the other factors other than money that matter is really important. And that's something I think realtors are better at doing than your average buyer. The other thing is we all get paid on when we help people buy and sell. So if you're buying a property for yourself, you can use your commission to help pay closing costs. You can use it to lower the price of the property. I always recommend to my agents that they use it to get a credit or lower the price of the closing price of the property. Because if you take it as a income, you're going to obviously have to pay income taxes on it. And so you do, you lose some of the, the value of that money. Whereas if you roll it into the property, um, you can, you can get a bigger benefit over time with it if you don't need it right now. Another thing realtors should get is that if you're helping direct a lot of business to different vendors, so roofers and plumbers and electricians and inspectors, typically they offer discounts and um, preferential treatment to the people that are helping their businesses. And so if you have vendors you're working with, um, make sure to ask for discounts or consideration or to be prioritized if you have a project you want to get done quickly. Another thing that I think realtors have a better understanding of uh, than your average kind of starting out investor is private financing or seller carried financing. Uh, private financing and seller carried financing allows you to potentially put less money down um, to borrow on a property that isn't traditionally financeable. Or if you have a large portfolio, sometimes it can be difficult to borrow um, and get new loans if you already have a certain amount of loans on properties and that's a way to continue to build your portfolio um, for whatever reason if the property or you don't qualify for the financing through a traditional bank there's two main ways to do private financing um, there's a real estate sales contract which is preferential to the seller typically and there's a note and trust deed which is more preferential to the buyer in terms of protections in the case of a default so to make sure if you're going to use private financing for yourself or for your clients that you have an attorney that puts that together. There are some title companies that can do that. Typically, it's pretty rudimentary. It might not cover all the bases. So I always recommend people put a little extra money into the process and get an attorney to give them um, a you know, properly done real estate sales contract or note and trustee. Another thing you can do, and, and I've known people that have built their whole portfolios this way, is they have investor clients that try to buy properties. And many times the investor is happy and they buy the property. But sometimes they go into escrow and they negotiate and they decide, you know what, this isn't the right deal for me or I'm not happy with the price or the terms and they decide to terminate. And so as a realtor, you know everything about that property. You've been to the inspections, you've helped negotiate it. Uh, you know as much about it as anyone else. And if you think it's a great deal, maybe it's something that would be a great fit for you and your portfolio. My only caution there is that if your client is terminating as a way to negotiate, make sure you clarify with them in writing that they are indeed terminating and done with the property, that they're not doing it as a way to try to negotiate a lower price. And then I think you're good to go to buy it. And it's a great way to do things because like I said, you already know the property, you know the price, it's, you know the inspections, you know everything about it. A new thing that has a, a new name is being an iBuyer. Now, realtors know that iBuyers have been around for ages. It's uh, just been a little bit of a different style. It's been your sign that's been tacked up to a telephone pole or a billboard that says we buy houses in cash in three days or we buy early houses. That's an iBuyer as well. And now that's been given a lot of money from Wall Street to try to um, kind of try to get into the real estate model and, and go directly to the sellers and have them sell the house. And for the folks out there that are familiar with that, um, the way that typically works is that they take a pretty big discount or a service fee when they buy. So they're buying it below market. 
Now that being said, there's a lot of sellers that don't want to go on the market. They don't want to do an open house. They don't want people going through their home or they want to just close very quickly and as is and they're willing to take a large discount for that convenience. And if you're in a good position, either on your, with your own financing or with investors you work with, uh, you can be an iBuyer as well, just as anyone can represent themselves and buy for themselves. Now there's some cons to investing for realtors, and I wouldn't say they're necessarily cons, they're just some things you need to make sure you cover to be in compliance. So you need to make sure you properly disclose in the contract um, when you're buying or selling that you are um, an agent licensed in the state. So you want to clearly uh, make sure that the other party knows that your uh, license status, whether you're a broker or an agent or managing broker or whatever your particular state calls it, and properly disclose that uh, to the other party. Um, another thing to be aware of is implied agency. And what that means is uh, implied agency is when someone thinks that you're their agent or you're doing things that agents do for people. And so if you're going to buy a property for yourself and the other party doesn't have an agent or an attorney that's representing them, you need to make sure it's very clear that you're not their agent and you're not acting as their agent. And that means that you can't tell them, you can't give them advice about the property, you can't give them advice about the price. And I would recommend that you disclose not only that you're a licensed agent, but also that you know you have inside market knowledge and you intend to make a profit um, so that there's no, um, or there's less risk of the person coming back and saying that they got bamboozled um, and, and I always advise people that if they don't have uh, an agent or an attorney that you recommend that you told them they should get an attorney or an agent to represent them and they've chosen not to. And I think if you've done all that, you've done your duty and it's the other person's choice what they choose to do and can create an opportunity for you. Um, now cash flow arrangement, keep in mind you're running a business as a realtor as well. And so you want to be thoughtful of where your money is coming from. And typically, most people are going to make more money running their business uh, in any given year than they'll make on their investments or their uh, real estate portfolio. Because typically, when you start out, your cash flow isn't going to be as dramatically positive as it is on your business. So make sure you're thoughtful of how you're allocating your cash resources to investing in real estate and how you're allocating it to running your business. Another thing I hear from realtors that are concerned about investing for themselves is, um, does it create a distraction away from their business? Uh, and so for some agents, uh, if you work with a lot of investors or developers or house builders, it might be seen as competing with your own clients. Now, in that sense, if I feel like something's a great opportunity for a client, I always let them know about it first. And if they're not interested or they don't like the price, then I would pursue it myself if I felt like it was a good property. But again, it's a balance. I think early in your career, you want to focus most of your time and attention on growing your business and becoming a more successful realtor um, and take some time each year to look for opportunities and save up extra money and, and do a couple extra deals so you have a down payment available every year or two to buy a good opportunity when you see it. Um, and be aware of you know how much time you're spending on that. I typically see some realtors that get into investing as they go along in their careers. They spend more and more of their time on their own real estate portfolio and less and less time uh, trying to find and service new clients. The other thing to keep in mind too, while it can be really exciting to build a portfolio, and I know a lot of people that love to talk about how they've added a certain number of doors or square feet to their portfolio every year, you wanna be thoughtful of your asset allocation and your cash flow. So again, most investments, typically when they start out, aren't throwing off a ton of free cash. And so you have uh, a net wealth growing effect when you own real estate in an appreciating market. And it should add cash flow and it should add to your bottom line as well. But you wanna make sure you don't end up in a situation where you become what's called land rich and cash poor. What that means is you're fully invested. All of your money's invested in real estate or all of your money's invested in something and you don't have reserves left over. So while it it can be tempting to go all in, make sure you have some reserves for any unforeseen expenses or to help weather a downturn in the market or higher vacancy.
All right, now let's talk about property types. Most people start out, they buy their first house. And when I'm counseling uh, agents that are starting out in their careers or folks that have flexibility to live in a multifamily unit, I often recommend that if they can do it, if it works for their household, to buy a duplex or triplex or fourplex owner-occupied. Now, and you remember why is because if you go back to the leverage piece, if you're owner-occupied, you can put a significantly smaller amount down. What that means is you can get invested sooner or you could buy more than one property. So um, a home is great because you get to live in it. We all have to live somewhere. So you're either paying a mortgage or you're paying rent. And when you're paying your mortgage, you're, you're paying yourself. With multifamily, uh, whether you live in it or not, you have more units, which means um, if you have a house that's a rental and the tenant moves out, you're 100% vacant. But if you have a fourplex and a tenant moves out, you're only 25% vacant. And that's a lot easier to weather than 100%. So um, that's one reason I like having a couple units over just a single unit. And in most markets, multifamily is going to give you a better rate of return than a simply a house. Uh, another thing that folks are doing more and more is uh, Airbnb, VRBO, or short-term uh, rentals. Now, the way that most cities classify that is called transient. It's the same thing as a hotel. And there's a lot of different rules and regulations that go along with this. And a lot of cities now are looking to uh, ha put heavier taxes, um, additional permit requirements, uh, zoning and code requirements on these units. And so it's getting more and more difficult to operate short-term rentals in a lot of places. And there's a lot of cities and municipalities looking to basically ban them completely. So my, my thought on that is to make sure you're aware of the situation in your market and be very cautious about any uh, properties with an HOA. So a condo or uh, you know a fee simple development where there is an HOA in addition to the city regulations, because what you'll find is a lot of those condo associations are already restricting the use of uh, short-term rentals or could potentially do that in the future. So be aware of the different rules and regulations for the folks that are able to do this. And again, there's a lot of ways to do it legally. Uh, you can have fantastic cash flow because you have a higher management hassle and higher management expense, um, but your cash flow can be much, much higher, sometimes two or three times what it would be for a short-term rental. One of the top tiers of investing and where people typically end up as they've built their portfolios is in commercial real estate. Now, commercial real estate has some pros and cons. The cons being that typically the financing for commercial properties is shorter term. So you typically have a three to 10 year loan term versus residential where you can go 15, 20 or 30 year loans very commonly. And so you've got a shorter term loan that you have to refinance or renew and the rate could change and you need more money down. And typically the inspections um, and the tenant improvements on commercial properties are significantly more expensive than on residential. So if you're gonna buy a commercial property where a residential property might require a total of $1,000 in inspections, it's very common commercial to be five, 10, $15,000. Um, if you're doing a change of use, uh, you might be needing to bring in engineers and architects and have multiple meetings with cities and get additional permits to make those changes. So um, if you're not familiar with commercial real estate, if you're primarily a residential broker, I would highly recommend you work with a commercial realtor to help you with that because there are a lot of different layers of complexity with commercial that don't exist in the residential space. All right, positive leverage. I mentioned this earlier. So we have our $500,000 apartment. Now, if you paid cash, your cash on cash return is the same as your return on investment, which is also called a cap rate. So if you put in $500,000 cash, you buy the property, you get $30,000 of annual net income, and that gives you a 6% return on the property. Now, this is, a pretty, this is pretty equal to a real world scenario uh, for what we're seeing in the market in most places. Now, if you're in San Francisco or LA or New York, your numbers, your rate of returns will be much lower. And if you're in the Midwest or in a more rural area, typically your rate of return is going to be much higher. And that's because in areas with low rates of return, the assets typically appreciate more 
and in areas with higher rates of return, most of your return comes from the investment itself and not asset appreciation. Now, let's look at a different scenario. Let's say that same property, you put 50% down. And now your cash on cash return goes up to 8%. Now in this scenario, if you look at the bottom, we're looking at a 30 year loan at 4%. So you're paying 4% on the loan, but you're getting 6% return on the property. And so when you do that, now you've invested half the money, but you're still collecting $20,000 of net annual income. And that creates an 8% return. Now here's scenario three. In this scenario, you only put 25% down, and by doing that, your cash on cash return goes up to 12%. So you're only putting 125,000 in, you're borrowing the rest, you're getting $15,000 of net annual income, and that gives you a return of 12% on your down payment. Now the catch here is that if you have a half million to invest and you wanna use leverage, you either have to buy a bigger property or you have to buy multiple properties to get the same cash on cash return. And the pro of putting all cash down and not borrowing money is if you have a vacancy, you're still having expenses, you still have utilities, you still have taxes, you still have insurance, but you're not also paying interest and principal on a mortgage. So you're, you're more protected in downturns, but you're limiting the amount of uh, money you have invested in real estate because you're not using leverage. So it's important when you buy a property, you're gonna be building a team. Now, if you're doing uh, work in a market and in a property type you're familiar with, you can be the realtor for yourself. And there's definite benefits for that. Like I said, using the commission for yourself. If you are going to buy in a different market or you're going to buy a property type you're not familiar with, I typically hire someone and pay them the full, let them keep the full fee because I want them to treat me just like they would any client. I'm going to ask them for the same advice and help. Well, I might know a lot about what's going on in Portland and Vancouver. Um, it doesn't mean I know a lot about what's going on in Boise or Reno or New York City. So you're going to need a good lender. Again, with um, if you know commercial and you have great commercial lenders, you're great. To get, you're good to go. If you're familiar with residential, um, you probably already have a bunch of people you work with. If not, ask for referrals and and interview different people, just like you would in anything. You're going to want to have a good attorney that you can call on. Uh, hopefully you don't need them for much, but if you do, you want to have someone you can trust to give you good advice on landlord tenant law or contracts or zoning. It's always good to have a good CPA. Hopefully you already do. If not, you're going to want to get one because your life's going to get a little bit more complicated because each rental you buy is like its own little business in itself and you're going to have profits and losses. You're going to have tenants, different tax bills, different incomes and expenses that you need to keep track of. And obviously your title and escrow company it's going to help you uh, confirm that there's no liens or encumbrances you're not familiar with or not aware of. And that's important to keep track of that. Um, and good contractors and architects, uh, those kind of go hand in hand. So if you have a property you need to repair or you want to confirm uh, the construction quality of a property, contractor is going to be the person for you. If you're buying anything commercial or with any unique zoning, an architect is typically best resource for understanding the current zoning and use in your area um, for your property type. And if you want to do a change of use or a rezone, um, an architect or a land use attorney are going to be the people that can help you navigate the city. All right, building your portfolio. I talked about this a little at the beginning, but there's kind of a sequence that people typically go through. Most people start with a house or an owner occupied plex. So they buy their first place, they move into it. Now, where a lot of people can start is that they have their plex or their house, they move out to their next property, and then they turn that into a pure investment property. If you already own a property and you wanna to add to it, an ADU, which is an accessory dwelling unit, or um, an in-law apartment is a way to add units. Check with your city and municipality on the different rules and regulations for this, but a lot of cities are encouraging this now, where you can add, uh, a converted basement apartment or an attic apartment or convert a garage or build an entirely new structure on the side yard or backyard of a property to add more living units that you can use for your family or, or have for short-term or long-term rentals. And typically once people have done that, they start buying true investment properties where you're putting more money down, you're not intending to live in it, you want to have tenants in it that are paying rent and it's just about the cash flow. 
So typically people start out with plexes because you can get residential financing. Uh, you own a couple of those, you want to graduate to an apartment. Apartments are easier to manage and maintain because you've got one roof, one tax lot, um, you know, one place to take care of as opposed to a bunch of different places all over town. Sometimes people get tired of dealing with tenants and so they want to graduate to apartments or for, to office and retail and industrial. Um, those have a lot less regulation. You have tenants that are staying there for five, 10, 20 years at a time, sometimes even longer in the case of like a Walmart or a Rite Aid. Uh, industrial, the tenants typically pay all the expenses. And with land, you don't even have a tenant. So land is kind of the last thing because it typically doesn't come with cash flow. And so you need to be thoughtful about how you're managing uh, your equity you have invested because land, you typically need more money down um, and it's more complicated to make that work. But in terms of an asset, it's one that if done right can um, be a great addition to your portfolio. I'm going to talk a little bit about distressed properties. Uh, in our area, it's about 5% of the market. It's very, very low right now. It might not even be that. Um, bank owned properties and short sales back in 2008 through 2012 made up a huge portion of our markets. And for some places it was the only market. Um, they come with pros and cons as well. As you know, with bank owned properties, a lot of times the utilities are off. The property has been vacant sometimes for years um, and you don't get disclosures. And so be thoughtful on all of that. Make sure you do your own inspections and, and definitely a buyer beware there. Short sales can be a great opportunity if you're willing to be patient. Um, but uh, as we all know, short sales don't take a short amount of time. So it's not something that makes sense if you have money you need to move right now or have an exchange. Uh, it's something that works if you've got time and, and you can wait. Now I wanted to take the last little bit we have together here to talk about an APOD. An APOD is a one page um, report, financial report on a property, and it takes a look at what's going on right now. And it stands for annual property operating data. And this is the one we actually use for our clients. Um, this is a spreadsheet where we put in all the information um, about the income and the expenses and uh, the loan. And it calculates what we can expect or what our clients can expect for their rate of return on our property based on where it is right now. And once we know that, we can start changing variables. So let's say the property um, has rents that are below market and we can raise rents. Um, we could look at it as it stands today and where we think it could be if the rents were raised to market. Uh, sometimes buildings are poorly managed or have higher expenses than they should. So maybe if you manage the property better, um, you don't even need to raise rents and you can create a better rate of return. Maybe there's a different loan program that would offer a lower interest rate, increase your rate of return. So this looks at a couple things. So you'll see different uh, cells in this form or in this spreadsheet that have percentages. Um, those aren't set. Uh, it's going to be different. So for example, management is a soft cost. If you're vacant, there's no management cost. If it's full, you're going to be paying the full percentage on your income for the management. Um, typically in our market, I would just say for a single family house, you're probably paying 10% for management of your gross rents. And with a larger apartment building, you might be four or five or 6% depending on whether or not you have additional on-site management. Now to figure this out, you need to know the purchase price and the potential rental income. If a property is currently stabilized, which means it's full, you can um, use the actual numbers uh, to, to fill this out. If it's vacant or if it's new construction, uh, oftentimes you'll use market rate numbers and then market rate vacancy. Once you have the potential rental income and you know the vacancy in your market, you can come up with a gross operating income. And when you know that, then you just figure out your expenses. So um, the hard costs are your real estate taxes. That's set, it doesn't change, it's not a percentage based on whether you're full or vacant. Um, your repairs and maintenance reserves are soft costs. That, again, you can look at years past and say what it actually has been, but Maybe it isn't being managed well, or maybe there are some bigger expenses coming up, like you need to replace a roof next year, or the furnaces are all 20 years old and you know you're going to have to start replacing those. Um, insurance is typically a hard cost. It's set. You know what it is. Uh, your garbage is typically set. Water and sewer is going to be variable depending on use. So if it's vacant, you're using less. If it's full, you're using more. Same with your power bill. Um, 
if you have a large lot or a big parking area or a, a bigger property with pools and uh, gyms and different amenities, you're going to have a higher maintenance cost for those than if you have a infill townhome apartment with no yard um, and you just walk out the front door on the sidewalk. So from your gross operating income, you minus out all of your operating expenses, and that gives you your net operating income, or NOI. A lot of people, you'll hear that word bandied about. What's your NOI? Well, that means net operating income. So that's your potential rental income minus vacancy. Um, you would also add in, I forgot to mention, you know, additional income, so storage, pet rent, parking. Uh, we have RUBS here. That's rental utility billbacks. So a lot of folks now are, are charging a set amount, $50 per apartment or $100 per apartment for utilities. Um, if, like, let's say your heat is all run off of one furnace, that's a way to get some of that ink money back that you're spending on utilities. Um, take out all, so you put all the money in, take all the expenses out, that gives you your net operating income, and that gives you your cap rate. And I'm going to give you these formulas next. So the first metric you use in investment property is gross rent multiplier. And all you need to know is what is the price and what are the gross rents per year? Keep in mind, everything here is annual. There's no monthly anything with investing. It's always, you always look at it as a, a one-year look. The next metric, you need to know all the expenses. So you have to have the price, the income, and expenses to figure out the net operating income. Then you can figure out your cap rate. Your cap rate is the percentage rate of return. So it's, it's like a yield, but it it's not yield because yield doesn't take a yield takes into account future appreciation. Cap rate is what's going on right now. That's like a one year snapshot look. And the last thing you can figure out with this um, APOD is your cash on cash return. So the next piece of information you need if you're going to do cash on cash return is the terms of the loan and the amount of the down payment. So you need to know how much money is actually going into this investment and then what are the terms of the loan and you can figure out your cash on cash return. So here's the formulas for these three metrics. And I would say that these are really important to know if you're going to be investing in real estate for yourself or if you want to start working with investors, helping them buy. Gross rent multiplier is just acquisition price divided by gross rents. Basically, it says how many years of gross rent will it take to um, equal the amount that you're paying for the building. The lower the gross rent multiplier, the better for the investor, the higher, uh, the better for the seller. For a capitalization rate or a cap rate, it's the cash flow before taxes or the net operating income and um, your acquisition price. And then on the right, I apologize there, that should be cash on cash. Um, that's your cash flow before taxes, um, which is your net operating income minus your debt service. So it takes into account your loan payments and then uh, the money you actually invested, and that will give you your cash on cash return, um, which uh, is your actual rate of return you're getting on the money you have invested in the property. So that covers kind of the basics. I know we dove deep into some topics and, and hopefully I was able to cover all of the big picture basics and give you guys a great working understanding of investing and the pros we have as being real estate professionals and realtors when we go to invest for ourselves and some steps we can take to make sure we do it ethically. But whether you're just getting started or you've been doing real estate for a long time, whether you have a small portfolio or you haven't bought your first property yet or you're looking at fine tuning your portfolio, I hope you've gotten some great ideas and information on how to look at investing for yourself because my goal and, and I hope that all of you take steps to do this in 2020 is to encourage and inspire you guys to make a little bit extra, do a couple more deals, uh, save up the money for a down payment so you can get started on the path of investing for yourself and building wealth and financial independence uh, for you and your family and maybe for generations to come. And I think now we're going to be doing some Q&A. So, Brittany, yep. I don't know if you're taking back over here, but i um, excited to talk about some Q&A here and answer some questions. Yes. Awesome stuff. Thank you so much, Nick, for that informative presentation. So, now at this time, we do have some questions in our queue. 
So for members who are listening in, it's not too late to submit a question. Simply send a message to the chat or you can shoot us an email at financialwellness at nar.realtor. Okay, there's the email right there on the display screen. So for those who are asking in regards to when the presentation will be available, please know it's going to be available on Friday, January 24th, and I'll provide more information after the Q&A. So first question for you, Nick, what does the IRS use to determine the value of the commercial property to calculate the depreciation? So the way that the IRS does that is they look at um, the value of the building when it was put into service. So basically, um, how is the building valued when it was first uh, used as an investment property or as a rental? So for example, in the, in the case of uh, the $500,000 apartment building, if you bought that property and it was fully leased and it's working as an investment property, it would be what the building value is at that time and you depreciate it from that point forward. Um, and there's, there's two ways to basically, uh, th there's a couple ways that people typically do it. Um, the easiest way is the tax assessor, the county tax assessor's determination of what the land value is and what the building value is. Now, if you disagree with that and you think that the building is worth more than the tax assessor says, you could look at your appraisal and say, hey, I have a third party appraisal for when I bought the building that says the building is worth this much and the land is only worth that much. Um, a lot of uh, accountants and CPAs will kind of arbitrarily just say that it's 80% building value, 20% land. But again, if you buy a small building on a very large lot, uh, that might not be the case. Um, and it might be the case um, where the building far exceeds the land value and maybe it's 90% building value and 10%. But you need it a, effectively, you want to have a third party defensible uh, opinion, which would be an appraisal or the tax assessor's uh, determination. Perfect. So what information do you look at to get an understanding of what a property could actually rent for? Great question. Um, I think that there's a couple ways to do it. There's a lot of good resources online now that are trying to speed up this process, but I think that uh, I would recommend people work with a professional property manager unless they also are working as, I know a lot of realtors are property managers as well. If that's not your specialty, I think it's great to have someone else managing those properties because it, you're investing less time and you're making sure that they know the rules and regulations. That being said, one of the things a property manager should be able to do for you is give you rent comps to say, hey, um, I know you're thinking of buying this apartment building in this neighborhood. And um, in that neighborhood, one bedrooms rent for 1,000 and two bedrooms rent for 1,300 and three bedrooms rent for 1,500. Uh, so a property manager should be able to help you with that. And then I, I would just pretend you're a tenant. Go online, look on uh, Craigslist, Zillow, uh, look at the apartment ads um, anywhere the, that people are putting them and see, you know, what are people asking for rent? And is that property nicer than mine? Does it have better amenities? Is it older? Is mine nicer? Um, to get an idea of, of what the market is for rent in that area. Okay, perfect. So a couple people have been asking about the APOD forms. Um, for those sheets that you have and that you mentioned earlier, is there a way that you can send it out to members or maybe there's a location of where they can find it? Um, what do you suggest, Nick? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I'd be happy to send one with all of the formulas uh, to you, Brittany. Is that something you could forward along to the group or make a, as an attachment? Yes, I can include that. Okay, I'll make sure that I get that to you. Um, and then we have um, an investor guide on our website uh, which is cityandstatere.com, and I want to say, I should know this off the top of my head. I think it's in fact, we just uh, redid our website, so I apologize for not knowing this. Okay, yeah, cityandstatere.com slash invest, and that'll take you to our investing guide which has um, 
more information um, than we were able to go over in this presentation. And it has uh, some case studies with that APOD, but um, I'll be happy to get an actual APOD out to you guys, uh, to you, Brittany, to share with everyone as well. Awesome. Thanks so much, Nick. Um, I do have another quick question for you. So any suggestions on how syndicating an investment purchase? Yeah. So I guess, yes, if you could assist. On syndications? Sure. So uh, what syndication means is um, basically you're, you find the opportunity and then you get a group of investors together to buy it as a group. Um, now that's a pretty deep topic and you're definitely going to need to get an attorney involved to help you figure out um, uh, the best way to structure that um, because you're going to have to be really clear on the type of entity you create um, and you want to make sure um, you're not creating um, uh, a, you know, an offering that would be controlled by the SEC. Um, so there's, there's different ways to do that. The oldest and simplest way is just a tenant in common where, you know, let's say you find a building you want to own, but you don't have enough money to do it yourself. So you need three other people to join you and everyone puts in 25% and you go buy the building as a group. <laughs> the pros are you can buy bigger buildings. Uh, the cons are that you're sharing ownership. So you need to be clear on what the rules are of how decisions are made. What if someone wants to sell and someone else doesn't want to sell? What do you do if there is an issue where, um, let's say there's a vacancy and you need to do tenant improvements, uh, how is that getting paid for? So there's definitely a, a lot more to cover than I can in just now. But um, in terms of syndication, that's what that means, um, and there's a lot of different ways to do it. And I would just, my big words of wisdom are make sure you really are clear on the entity, clear on how it's managed, and how you get your money in and out, um, and make sure you're not doing something that uh, is, is under the jurisdiction of the SEC, or, and if it is, that, that there's a sponsor that's qualified to do those offerings. Okay. So one last question for us, and then I think we're going to wrap it up. Um, what strategy or resource did you use to set an investment timeline for yourself? That's a great question. I think the thing that's the easiest guide is to look at what your household expenses are and, and have a goal of working towards offsetting your household expenses with your investment income. And it's not something you should try to do in one year or two or three years even. It's something that takes a long time and, and one of the secrets of investing is time. And so the longer you own a property, the more it appreciates, the more your asset, you know, your net worth goes up because of the asset value going up. And over time, you know, your mortgage is fixed, a lot of your expenses are fixed, but your income should be going up along with inflation in the market. So it's, as things get more expensive, the rent goes up. But you still paid what you paid for the building, whether it was last year or 10 years ago or 30 years ago. And so be patient, but I think it is good to set a goal of, hey, I want to buy my first investment property and I want to have $500 of cash flow. And let's say that you need $10,000 of cash flow to offset your household expenses for your family. Um, you're not going to be able to do it with one investment. I've been investing for a long time. I've got a large portfolio and it just takes time. And over time, your rents go up, um, the asset value goes up and you can kind of build towards it. But I would say the biggest thing to do is, is to get started uh, sooner than later because time is your biggest friend and enemy. The longer you wait, the harder it is. And the sooner you start, the easier it is. And um, again, even if we see a dip in the market, if you have good cash flow, that'll allow you to stay in the investment, even if the asset value goes down, keep taking the cash flow, and eventually the market comes back, it goes back up. Uh, we've seen it over and over again all over the place. Um, and that's one of the really big benefits of owning real estate with positive cash flow is it really does help you weather the storms so you don't have to sell when the market's down. That's such a good point. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nick, especially for that closing statement. Um, really appreciate everything in your time. And so one thing that I do want to add for our listeners, if you need to find additional resources, please feel free to visit 
financialwellness.realtor. This center will provide you with financial tools, there's calculators in there, and a robust library that's specifically geared for you. Also, we want you to take action, and if you're feeling motivated to get started, um, visit NAR's revised REBAC course on real estate investing. It's a six-hour training course that will cover the fundamentals of real estate investment that practitioners need to know in order to expand their business services. Discover the importance of investing in real estate, how to work with investor clients, financing options, tax benefits that Nick even touched on, and how to make that purchase decision and so much more. So you can log into financialwellness.realtor, select the Real Estate Investment Resource tab, and from there, you can access the course and walk the talk to become the real estate investor yourself. And don't worry, I'm gonna include the information. Right here, you can visit nar.realtor backslash CFSW backslash webinars. And for those of you who wanted the forms from Nick, his email is located at the bottom. Nick, where can they go again to get the resources from you from city and state? Yeah, it's cityandstatere.com forward slash invest. All right. And we'll make sure to send and that And that will give you access to our investor guide that we use for all of our clients. Perfect. All righty. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Nick. This concludes our webinar, and special thanks to our members for joining the call. So if you missed any part of this webinar session, we will be posting the recorded webinar and PowerPoint and the forms that Nick will send under nar.realtor backslash CFSW backslash webinars. I repeat, the recordings will be available for your review on Friday, January 24th. At the end of this session, a survey bar is going to pop up on your desktop browser. Please leave us your feedback on today's presentation. We love it when you guys tell us how well Nick has done. <laughs> Thank you, and we look forward to having you join us for our next Financial Source webinar on Wednesday, February 19th at 1 p.m. Central. Take care, guys, and thank you so much. Thank you, Nick. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Take care.